Well, hello, good afternoon, or good morning, or good evening, everyone, depending on what time zone you're joining us from. And welcome to this uh, webinar hosted by the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs at Georgetown University. Today, we'll be exploring the question of the possibilities and limits of India's religious soft power. And this uh, session is part of a broader project housed here at the Berkeley Center um, called The Geopolitics of Religious Soft Power. Um, this project um, explores the ways in which various states today incorporate religion and religious activities and religious outreach um, as part of their broader external relations and foreign policy conduct. Um, the project has been running since 2018 uh, and will uh, conclude next year. It's sponsored uh, with generous support from the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Um, my name is Peter Mandeville. I'm a senior research fellow uh, at the Berkeley Center, um, and it's been my honor to serve as the project's director over the last few years. I'm absolutely delighted that as um, part of the project, we've had the opportunity to commission a number of um, briefs that are designed uh, for use by a broader audience, including foreign affairs practitioners and policymakers. And these policy briefs focus on some of the countries that tend to be the focus of a lot of um, particularly strategic interest today. Um, so over the course of the next few months, uh, the project will be publishing policy briefs um, focused on India, uh, Turkey, Iran, Russia, and China. And the first brief in this series uh, was commissioned from Professor Sumit Ganguly of Indiana University, uh, who's joining us today as our feature presenter. Um, and we'll be doing one of these sessions in connection with each of the policy briefs um, to give you an opportunity to hear directly um, from the author. I'm gonna go ahead and put up in the chat room um, a set of links here. Uh, the first of them takes you to the landing page of the Geopolitics of Religious Soft Power Project. Um, that, that'll help you kind of learn a little bit more about the overall goals and aims of the projects. And if you want, uh, there's an opportunity there to sign up to be automatically notified um, each time we publish new content. Um, there's also a direct link um, to Professor Ganguly's policy brief uh, that was just published a little earlier this month. Um, so you'll be able to find and download that. Um, he, uh, he has an extensive background um, and in, in order to save time, rather than giving him uh, the, 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 the full introduction, I'm just gonna put up a link uh, here in the chat room uh, to his bio on the Indiana University webpage where you'll be able to learn about um, his, his enormous standing in the field uh, and his many accomplishments. Um, before turning over to Professor Ganguly, let me just briefly say something about um, the format that we'll be following today. Um, after a presentation from him uh, kind of sharing his thinking on kind of how India has used religion in its external relations in recent years uh, and kind of summarizing some of the key points of the policy brief, We'll be open, opening things up to you, the, the webinar participants, to pose questions. Um, you can pose those questions using the Q&A um, uh, feature that is uh, in the controls at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, you'll be able to type your, your question. Uh, the question will, will appear in a window uh, that I'm able to, to view. And so I'll be able to kind of moderate the, 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 the discussion, reading the questions out um, for Professor Ganguly um, to respond to. And we'll get through as many of them as, as we can. Um, as, as ever, um, you know, if you can be as succinct and as brief as possible um, in framing your question, that will help us to kind of make the best use of this time we have together. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce the real star of the show, Professor Sumit Ganguly, um, Professor of Political Science at Indiana University, where he also holds a distinguished chair uh, in the study of Indian civilizations. Uh, for my money, really the go-to person when it comes to questions of contemporary uh, Indian foreign policy, uh, not just of all because of his kind of conventional foreign policy analysis chops, but also because of his ability to contextualize things um, with respect to history, culture, 
um, and and uh, the, the kind of broader context that surround these questions. So without further ado, let me welcome Sumit, thank him for uh, making time to be with us today um, and hand the virtual floor, so to speak, over to him. Uh, thanks very much, Peter, for that extraordinarily generous introduction. Um, I am going to make five points in the course of my presentation today, and I'll try and be as succinct as possible. Um, yeah, the first is I'm going to talk about the initial years of India's foreign policy, particularly focusing on the Nehruvian period. Then I will talk about the post-Nehruvian era after his death in 1964. Then I will talk, talk about India uh, at the end of the Cold War. Uh, and uh, then turn uh, to really the substance of my talk, uh, the major thrust of my presentation on the rise of Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his departure from India's secular past and his use of religious soft power. And then finally, I will conclude with some thoughts about the limits of religious soft power and why those limitations do exist and how they are likely to hobble India's ability to effectively use religious soft power under Modi or possibly even a successor. So to start out with the Nehruvian legacy, at the very outset, it needs to be said that Prime Minister Nehru was sort of primus inter Paris. There was virtually no one in his cabinet who had the kind of understanding of international affairs or the passion that he brought to, this, uh, to Indian foreign policy. And Nehru sought to punch much higher than India's real weight in international affairs. India had emerged from British colonialism from 190 years of British colonialism, colonialism as a fairly impoverished country. And consequently, it had very little material power. But Nehru very deftly used moral suasion to focus on a number of important international issues, of global issues. For example, decolonization, global disarmament, uh, a passionate commitment to ending the apartheid regime in South Africa, promoting global peacekeeping. These were some of his principal concerns. And given fact that India was materially quite a weak power, it is really remarkable how he managed to use his voice and the idea of moral authority to talk about decolonization, to talk about global disarmament. And in fact, as early as 1954, along with the Irish, he introduced a resolution in the United Nations General Assembly calling for and uh, what's, what was referred to as a standstill agreement, putting an end to all nuclear testing. And it's fascinating to point out that eventually this became the basis of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, which has yet to be ratified on a global basis and still remains in abeyance. But the roots of this can be traced to Nehru's introduction of this resolution calling for a standstill agreement, which ultimately, by the way, also led to the partial test ban treaty, a step towards an eventual um, uh, uh, a comprehensive test ban treaty, which has yet to be realized, of course. So the fascinating thing here is that much of Nehru's efforts were based upon moral suasion, but it reflected a kind of secular idealism. While he drew upon India's grand civilizational heritage, he did not privilege any particular faith in his attempts to use soft power. After Nehru's death, um, there was a brief interregnum when a man called Lal Bahadur Shastri became India's prime minister, but sadly, he died within two years in office, and he, Nehru, Nehru was then succeeded by Indira Gandhi, his daughter. Indira Gandhi lacked Nehru's uh, intellectual firepower. It lacked Nehru's 
global vision, um, uh, Nehru's uh, uh, articulateness, and certainly Nehru's sort of intellectual prowess. And while she continued with some of her father's ideas about global disarmament, about the restructuring of the global economy to usher in a new international economic order. Most of this was seen by the world as empty rhetoric, largely because she lacked her father's intellectual stature and also because India really was a marginal economic player by the time she became prime minister. And furthermore, many of the sort of the idealistic goals of, of her father had fallen apart under Indira Gandhi, amongst other matters. Um, India uh, had not shown much aversion to the use of force, something that he had been passionately committed to. Um, India's politics began to resemble that of almost any other power. And the, again, the kind of moral authority that he had commanded had been mostly lost under Indira Gandhi. And consequently, uh, the world did not take Mrs. Gandhi or her successors especially seriously. Um, it, it was mostly seen uh, as a hoary rhetoric without much substance. It's really only at the end of the Cold War that India again comes to the fore in global affairs. Why? Because it acquires a modicum of economic power as it embraces a model of economic liberalization, which leads to rather dramatic economic growth, <laughs> India becoming uh, sort of the second fastest growing country in the world. And at one point by the late, uh, uh, by the early uh, part of the new millennium actually surpasses uh, the PRC in terms of economic growth. Um, consequently, India is taken much more seriously in global affairs. It is also bolstered by the India's other material capabilities, most notably its acquisition of nuclear weapons in 1998, uh, which it does uh, despite uh, flouting global public opinion ag against India's uh, acquisition thereof. So a combination of both military power and economic power makes India a much more serious uh, player that must be taken into account in global affairs. Along with all of this, India recognizes the significance of soft power, which leads to the creation of the division of public diplomacy in 2009. But again, the deployment of soft power uh, uh, under the aegis of this new division in India's uh, foreign policy establishment, the Ministry of External Affairs, does not make any reference to any particular faith. Instead, it focuses on India's civilizational heritage and how India's civilizational heritage makes it a significant global player, in addition to obviously its growing material capabilities. And this continues all the way until 2014, when we see the emergence of um, a blatantly religious party, the Bharatiya Janata Party, which had, by the way, come to power initially in 1998, but as part of a coalition government. And as part of a coalition government, it had to moderate its deeply held religious convictions and chose not to bring those to the forefront. But once in 2014, when Prime Minister Narendra Modi comes to power, uh, again in a coalition government, but with an outright majority in parliament, it basically uh, it abandons any sort of restraints that might have existed on the explicit uh, embrace of religion in public life and the resort to the use of religious soft power. This marks a clear departure from India's secular ideals, which had frayed to some degree in any case under Indira Gandhi. But when she 
departed from religious ide uh, from secular ideals, they were largely because of political exigencies, of electoral compulsions, of electoral demands. They did not represent a frontal assault on India's secular heritage. They were mostly um, uh, uh, responses to contingencies. Modi, however, makes no bones about his embrace of religion and the embrace of the majority faith, Hinduism, uh, the faith of close to 80% of India's population. And then he employs religious soft power in the conduct of Indian foreign policy, and I will provide a range of examples. Amongst other matters, he embraces Buddhism, which is a faith which really had started out as a, um, uh, as a challenge to sacerdotal authority in Hinduism. And at a certain point, Buddhism was absorbed into Hinduism, at least Mahayana Buddhism, the greater vehicle, was absorbed into Hinduism with Buddha seen as Gautama Buddha seen as the ninth incarnation of one of the key members of the Hindu pantheon, uh, the god Vishnu, the preserver. And that, so Buddhism in effect has close organic ties with Hinduism. And consequently, uh, it was easy for Modi to vis visit Buddhist shrines in Sri Lanka and in Nepal and to highlight India's contributions to Buddhism. And again, try to link it up with Japan, a country India was courting both for strategic and for economic reasons. Um, uh, Modi also <laughs> gave a considerable boost to the creation of what is, or to the resurrection of something called the Nalanda University, a major center for the study of Buddhism in the state of Bihar uh, in Northern India. He also visited perhaps one of the most important Hindu shrines in Nepal quite early in his uh, 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 in, in office called the Pashupatinath Temple, and he also donated 2,500 kilograms, almost five, over 5,000 pounds of sandalwood to the temple. And this sandalwood is used in a range of Hindu rituals and ceremonies, so it was an important gesture on his part. Modi is also credited uh, uh, to the creation under the aegis of the United Nations, the International Day of Yoga the, on the 21st of June. He made it a major uh, enterprise under his uh, uh, government and ultimately succeeded in this endeavor. Uh, here are certain examples. I could uh, obviously talk about more and I will mention one last attempt. And Modi has also seized upon India's Jewish heritage, something that most people are unaware of because it's a minuscule community and it became even smaller after the creation of the State of Israel, not because of the rise of anti-Semitism in India, far from it, but because of the material opportunities that Israel afforded to the Jewish community and also a sense of an organic link with Israel that the Jewish community felt, which is why substantial numbers of them emigrated to Israel. Um, and India historically, because of its commitment to decolonization and be, uh, because of the presence of a large Muslim community had long kept Israel at an arm's length. But after the Oslo Accords, India had opened up relations in 1992 with Israel. Modi successfully built upon this opening quite dramatically and sought to build a multifaceted relationship with Israel where he also linked it to India's Jewish heritage. I'll let uh, the, the discussion of India's soft power under Modi go at this point and then now turn to a discussion of the limits of the use of religious soft power under Modi. And the limits largely stem from India's domestic circumstances. To begin with, under Modi, 
there has been considerable overt hostility towards India's largest minority community, Muslims. Muslims have been hounded and marginalized under this government, and Modi, for the most part, has maintained a studied silence on attacks on Muslim communities, attacks on Muslim individuals, uh, and only under considerable pressure, uh, particularly from abroad, he's made a couple of anodyne statements about the importance of religious harmony. But the record clearly indicates that Modi has little or no interest in protecting the rights of minorities in India. And this is evident from at least, and particularly Muslims, this is evident from two pieces of legislation that have been passed uh, under Modi. One is the Citizenship Amendment Act, which allows people from all of India's neighboring countries uh, to come to India uh, under an accelerated program of citizenship, but it carefully excludes Muslims. When this was brought up in parliament, Modi's argument and the argument of his government was, well, Muslims don't constitute a uh, besieged minority uh, in uh, the countries like Afghanistan and Pakistan and Bangladesh, and consequently, we don't need to worry about them. But the interesting thing is, he doesn't say a word about the fact that there are beleaguered Muslims, say the Ahmadiyas, who constitute a sect of Islam in Pakistan, who are not being given these same rights. Uh, uh, or say the Rohingyas in Burma, Myanmar, uh, who face persecution under a uh, fairly racist regime in Myanmar, but not a word about their plight. So it clearly shows that this was an anti-Muslim endeavor, despite the attempts to put the best possible face on this legislation. In addition to this, he has, there's an attempt to create what's called the National Register of Citizens, which disproportionately will affect Muslims and other minorities because they tend to be poorer in India, especially Muslims. And you have to produce certain kinds of documentation to demonstrate your citizenship uh, and to guarantee your citizenship. This will disproportionately fall on the backs of Muslims, despite attempts to argue that there is no such bias that's inherent in the NRC. There have also been instances of attacks on churches in India, and, and there is a long-standing hostility within the BJP and particularly one of the affiliates of the BJP, a militant wing of the BJP called the RSS, the Rashtriya Swamsevak Sangh. And this organization historically and ideologically has had a, uh, 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 has had a deeply uh, uh, dubious view of Christians and Christian missionary activity, even though Christian missionary activity has been woefully unsuccessful in India, given that a minuscule portion of the population are Christians, uh, less than 5% of the population. So if this is the success of, prop, uh, of proselytization, give me failure any day. Uh, nevertheless, there is this deep-seated hostility that the RSS has long had a ideologically rooted hostility towards Christian missionary activity. And consequently, uh, there have been attacks on individual Christians, on uh, Christian communities, on churches in India. And all of this, I would argue, juxtaposed with attempts to show and showcase India's religious heritage, it seems like a direct contradiction. If the most uh, weak and minority communities, religious communities, feel beleaguered and threatened, how is it 
that you can make this passionate argument about how India is this great repository and home of a range of religions which lives in harmony and in peace. Let me stop over here and open up the floor to questions, comments, and possible criticisms. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Sumit, for that masterful overview of the current state and indeed the historical evolution of India's religious soft power. Um, for those of you who perhaps joined us uh, after my introduction, um, uh, I want to go ahead and put up once again in the chat room uh, the links to uh, Sumit's policy brief. I'm, I have no doubt that his presentation just now uh, has really whetted your appetite. So please do go ahead and, and download that so that you can um, have the opportunity to read through the full product. I, I also wanted to remind everyone that this session is being recorded um, and will be made available, the recording will be made available shortly on the event page uh, on the Berkeley Center's website. And those of you who registered for the event will automatically um, receive a, uh, a link to that video recording once it's available. So we are going to go ahead and uh, pivot over to the question and answer portion of our program this afternoon. Um, and I'm happy to say that over the course of uh, Sumit's opening remarks, we already had several questions uh, that, that came in. Um, just to remind you again on, of the, the procedure for that, um, those of you who'd like to ask questions, you'll see uh, in the Zoom control bar at the, towards the bottom of your screen, a Q&A button that you can press. And this will allow you to type your question um, into the window that then becomes visible to me and I can um, put it to uh, Sumit for his response. Um, I, I would uh, remind and encourage you also um, to, to actually pose a question. Um, I've noticed sometimes that in these sessions, participants will just kind of add comments or commentary on some of the points that have been raised without asking a question. Certainly when I can detect an implicit question in a comment, I will put that to Sumit, but as much as possible, I'd, I'd ask you to please um, ask a specific question. So um, we, we already have six summits, so <laughs> seatbelts on and, and here we go. The, 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 the first one is, is I I interesting because it gets a little bit into the historical side of things. It comes from Tarunjit Butalia, who says, Mohandas K. Gandhi also seemed to use religious soft power for India's freedom struggle while defending the caste system and alienating minority religious communities. This continuum seems to have played out till now. Modi has continued this strategy, but with more vigor uh, in his politics of Hindutva. What are your thoughts on how Gandhi and Modi both have used religious soft power for their political ob objectives while alienating religious minorities? Um, actually, I would slightly disagree with that characterization. I would not, uh, both Gandhi and Mo Modi uh, hail from the same state, but that's where the similarities end. Uh, Gandhi did use religious soft power, but for Gandhi, the use of religious soft power meant respect for every faith. Uh, even in Sir uh, Richard Attenborough's film of Gandhi, that's one thing that really comes through. His view of Dalits or untouchables in India is a bit more ambivalent. He thought somehow or other they could be brought into the Hindu fold. I think there was a bit of naivety on his part in not recognizing adequately the kind of acute oppression that uh, the Brahmin community had long subjected untouchables or Dalits, as they are called, um, uh, or they prefer to be called, uh, 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 had been subjected to for over a millennia. And I think that, uh, that naivety apart, I, I don't think Gandhi ha had any ill will whatsoever in his body towards the Dalits. Modi, I think, is a wholly different kettle of fish. As far as Dalits are concerned, he simply sees them uh, as a, what in, in Indian politics is referred to as a vote bank. As long as he can cultivate their vote, I don't think he cares very much about their 
economic or political plight. It's simply a matter of electoral advantage that he seeks. So I think that I would make a clear distinction between, say, Gandhi's naivety about how the, the uh, Dalits could be uplifted and brought back into the larger fold of Hinduism and given a measure of equality. And Modi's completely sort of cynical and instrumental uh, use of Dalits. Great, thank you. Um, and we actually have a couple of other very interesting questions from uh, Taranjit that I promise we'll, we'll try to get to time permitting. Um, but, but in the, the interest of inclusivity, let me move on to a couple of other questioners. We, we have one uh, here from Richard Waugaman who asks, what are some of the reasons that Modi, like Trump and some other world leaders, no longer pursue tolerance and inclusivity in populations they rule, but instead pander to prejudice and all sorts of religious and other internal differences? Isn't it obvious that diversity coupled with tolerance creates national strength, whereas intolerance produces weakness? Uh, this is a, a particularly <laughs> telling question. And frankly, it would require another session um, to fully answer this. So I will give a kind of a um, very telegraphed answer uh, to a really sweeping question. Um, there has always been a strain of religious intolerance in India's political culture, even though people like Gandhi uh, the India's first uh, 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 education minister, Maulana Abul Kalam Azad, who was a Muslim scholar of some repute, of course, Prime Minister Nehru, uh, and others were passionately committed to the idea of a secular, plural, civic polity. That was the dominant strain of Indian nationalism. But alongside that, there was always a strain of Hindu nationalism, which had existed and had mostly been marginal until the 1980s when it started to come to the fore. And Modi is the logical culmination of the rise of those forces and the marginalization of secular forces. How this came about is an extremely complex story, but in the interests of time, I'll simply say it had to do with the failure of the Congress party to uphold these secular ideals, particularly under Indira Gandhi and subsequently others who gave space and gave leeway to the rise of Hindu nationalism uh, and, and Hindu nationalism has preyed upon majoritarian fears, just as in this country, Trump has played on majoritarian fears about the loss of white low, lower middle class privilege. Uh, similarly, with the rise of Dalits in Indian politics, with the increasing mobilization of Muslims in Indian politics, who claim a rightful place for themselves as equal citizens of India. The right wing and the forces of Hindutva have pandered to the fears of the majority community and thereby have created space for the rise of this form of muscular um, uh, uh, ethnic Hindu nationalism. But that's a very inadequate answer if this would really take up the entire session if I sought to answer it more fully or wholly. No, indeed, because it really does point to a, a global phenomenon that, that yeah. seems to take different forms in different countries, but yeah. often may be driven by some of the same factors. Absolutely. Um, Got a question here. You, you did um, touch to some extent on this next question, but Man Manjula Salomon asks if you can speak a little bit to how you think about and assess uh, particular risks faced by Christian communities in India uh, un under the Modi regime. As I mentioned in my brief, and if anyone cares or wants to read it, it's, there's a deeper discussion of this. But just a few years ago, one of India's most decorated and most highly respected former policemen, a man called Julio Ribeiro, felt compelled to write a letter uh, or a, an op-ed in the Indian Express, one of India's most prominent national dailies, saying that as a Christian, he finally 
uh, or he for, for the first time, not finally, he for the first time he felt insecure in his own land. That uh, and when and Ribeiro was one of the architects of the counterinsurgency strategy in the 1980s that brought an end to a major insurrection in the state of Punjab, risking his own life in the process. And when a man of his stature writes a letter indicating his sense of insecurity, it's a sign that, yes, this is something that must be taken seriously. Also, under the first BJP-dominated government in 1998, a Christian missionary of Australian origin was actually set on fire along with his two children, a man called Graham Staines, uh, in the state of Orissa in extreme eastern India uh, by certain Hindu militants who finally were brought to book, but after a rather protracted period of judicial delays. Um, uh, and all of these, uh, these episodes have created, and there have been attacks on churches, uh, and consequently, uh, the Muslim, uh, the Hindu, uh, the Christian community quite understandably feels a sense of insecurity. Okay, thank you. So, Mitt, this next question I almost hesitate to raise because it is also one of those that could be a multi-hour, you know, series of sessions unto themselves, and it invokes the dreaded S-word of secularism. W William Banak asks, is there any viable route back to secularism? I certainly hope so. Um, I, uh, not only do I have a uh, intellectual commitment uh, to secularism for instrumental reasons. I believe that secularism is absolutely crucial for India. You cannot run a country, you cannot rule a country um, and have democracy as we understand it, at least liberal democracy, without yoking it to secularism. Uh, but in terms of hopes, at the moment, we are going through, it, India is going through a very, very dark time. Why? Largely because of the BJP's anti-secular uh, uh, outlook, but simultaneously you have a deeply weak and disorganized opposition, which has been reduced to, to 44 seats in a 545 seat parliament. Never in India's history has the other has the dominant once dominant party been reduced to literally a skeleton of its former self and worse still it has not come up with a robust defense of secularism nevertheless there are powerful secular intellectuals in india who are besieged who are beleaguered but continue to write out and speak but what ultimately gives me faith in the, in the success of secularism is that the BJP does not really understand Hinduism. Hinduism is not a monolithic faith. It does not have a common book of prayer. It does not have a, a ideology or a set of beliefs that all Hindus can adhere to. Instead, as a great anthropologist, Milton Singer pointed out decades ago that it's the little traditions in Hinduism, the local rituals that give meaning to the lives of people. Whereas the BJP is trying to impose what's called a great tradition of Hinduism, which is Sanskritic in origin uh, on the, all of India. And this ultimately, in my view, from my li limited understanding of anthropology uh, and of, of comparative religions suggests that it will not work. Ultimately, it's the little traditions that animate people. For example, in my home state of West Bengal, it is the worship of the goddess Durga that is, uh, that is of paramount importance to Bengalis. Whereas you go to other parts of India and they'll say, who is the mother goddess. We don't even recognize her. Lord Ram, who is one of the great pantheon, members of the pantheon of Hinduism in Northern India, is seen as a cad in, uh, in, Beng in Bengal, largely because of the way 
the Ramayan, one of the two great epics of India, religious epics of India, was retold in Bengali. He's portrayed as a cad because he abandons his wife. Um, uh, and consequently, growing up in Bengal, in a deeply religious family, we were never told to revere Lord Ram, except you talk to my North Indian friends. And oh my God, for them, this is the Lord Ram is sort of the incarnation of all manly virtues. So this is a long-winded answer to a very important question. Okay, thank you, Sumit. I'm, I'm now going to combine together two questions that, that kind of get at, um, I think, the same sort of essence. Uh, this is, one, one is Mary Evelyn Tucker, Tucker of Yale University asking for some more specific examples of Modi's Hindutva approach. And she also asks if there have been any developments in the study of religion in universities. Um, and I'll kind of piggyback on that, the question from Annika Rosmöller from the University of Münster in Germany, who asks, could you discuss further how Modi uses references to Hinduism and how these are linked to the Hindutva ideology? And how can Hinduistic references be distinguished from general Indian civilization references as Hinduism itself is a term describing a manifold of religious and spiritual practices? Right. Um, and I'm delighted you combined uh, these two questions. It's manifested in a number of different ways. For example, there is something called the Indian Council of Historical Research. This is the apex body that provides funding to seminars, discussions, um, uh, to research. Uh, it's a substantial sum of money that it presides <coughs> over. Historically, um, this has been a left-wing organization. Let's be quite clear about this. Unless one had solid left-wing credentials, one could never become the head of the ICHR. On the other hand, the, the, despite having left-wing credentials, the people who became the chairs of the ICHR were first-rate historians while they might have had a shared political bias. What Modi has done, he has put in people who have no qualifications whatsoever worth the name, including a man who had no peer-reviewed articles presiding over the writing of history and history uh, and the conduct of history seminars and debates in the country. This led to outraged howls on the part of intellectuals across India. Modi couldn't be the least bit concerned. The, the Indian Film Institute, which again uh, is located in Western India and presides over the making of documentaries, of training uh, people in acting and in, in directing, again was given to a minor actor who had portrayed a character uh, uh, in one of the religious epics, which was made into a film, in, into a television series. Again, notice how he was selected, not because he's a major thespian with considerable standing, he was a minor figure drawn from this religious uh, television series. Um, uh, Modi has also, not so much Modi as much as people in his cabinet, have made disparaging remarks about Muslim immigrants from other countries, referring to them as termites, for example, sort of dehumanizing them in effect. Um, uh, other, uh, yeah, yet other examples, an attempt to change the writing of history curricula in civics textbooks, essentially uh, whitewashing <laughs> elements uh, of, of Hinduism which are unpleasant and highlighting the shortcomings of Islam throughout the ages in India and highlighting sort of uh, the hostility of Islam towards uh, uh, religious iconography and particularly Hindu religious iconography. So there's a panoply of ways by which Modi and his cabinet have sought to 
to transform essentially the writing of history in India and have sought to marginalize the contributions. Of, and oh, how could I possibly forget the most egregious example thereof? In 1992, um, under a, uh, a BJP government in the state of Uttar Pradesh, India's most populous state in northern India, a mosque was destroyed, the Babri Mosque, by Hindu miscreants on the urgings of the RSS. Uh, and uh, uh, Modi uh, ha is now building a temple and the first bricks are going to be laid on the, the ruins of that temple. It was litigated, by the way, in the Indian courts. And Modi has stacked the courts in such a fashion that even the Supreme Court of India, <coughs> which always used to be a genuinely impartial body, with minor exceptions in the past in the 1970s, when Mrs. Gandhi talked about a committed judiciary and had sought to stack the courts. Now Modi has so successfully stacked the courts, uh, the Supreme Court, <coughs> that it passed a judgment which essentially allowed for the building of a temple in, on the ruins of, of the mosque. And this will begin on the 5th of August next month. Okay, <laughs> well, where, where you ended there is actually a wonderful segue to the next set of questions that I'm going ah. to combine. And in fact, you may have already partly um, uh, answered them. So this one comes from Varughese John, who asks, what is your comment on the judiciary's responses in the recent years, which seem to play into the ruling government, especially the Ayodhya judgment, as well as the interpretation of constitution pertaining to religious conversion? And let me add to that um, uh, a question from Ola Yaskolska, apologies if I'm mispronouncing your name, who again also mentions that Prime Minister Modi will lay the foundation stone of the Ram Temple in Ayodhya on August 5th. Do you think that this is likely to be a pretext for communal violence once again as happened in 1992? Uh, at the outset, I certainly hope that this will not culminate in communal violence. Uh, to begin with, uh, uh, Muslim communities in India uh, feel so much under siege. I can't imagine them initiate any Muslim community in India initiating violence uh, because not only has the judiciary been politicized, but also now we are witnessing the politicization, politicization of the police force in India. And this was uh, amply evinced in December of last year when a group of students in New Delhi uh, at a, one of the most prominent centers of Muslim learning, the Jamia Millia Islamia University in New Delhi were protesting against the uh, Citizenship Amendment Act and the police behaved basically like goons, not unlike what is happening with federal forces in Portland or in Seattle uh, and elsewhere in this country, where they went and beat up the students, in including attacking students in the library. This has been well documented. Subsequently, there were riots in New Delhi and the reports on the riots released by the Home Ministry essentially constitute whitewash. So we are now witnessing the growing politicization of police forces in India, uh, the, uh, the increasing politicization of the Supreme Court, which was one of the last bastions of sort of impartial justice in India. And so there are deeply disturbing trends that are underway. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, this next question comes from Professor Mahdab Karim, who um, noting the formative years that he spent in India, specifically in the state of Bihar, as, as well as um, his analysis and research on the socioeconomic state of Indian Muslim communities, including periods of time spent in the country in recent decades, <clears throat> asks uh, comments that he has found uh, that Muslims tend to feel very secure in India. 
um, and is looking for your assessment of whether you think the situation is likely to become worse for Indian, uh, for Muslims in India, particular in states such as Uttar Pradesh, Gu Gujarat, and Ma Maharashtra. Um, did he say they feel secure in India? No, insecure. No, insecure. No. Yep, sorry, my apologies. Okay, no. I think I was clearing my throat on the first part <laughs> of that word. Yeah. For a second, I, I was a bit concerned. Uh, uh, their sense of insecurity is completely understandable, despite the rhetoric uh, that uh, is resorted to uh, by government officials uh, who simply uh, refer to the constitutional dispensation of India, which is true. Under the constitutional dispensation of India, which the, uh, ha Modi has not yet uh, tried to dilute, Muslims share and uh, have equal rights. But what is a constitutional dispensation and the reality are completely different. If one looks at socioeconomic statistics as a, uh, um, a, a major report by a former Supreme Court justice, Justice Sachar, uh, revealed a few years ago, there, there is incontrovertible evidence of the disparities uh, socioeconomic disparities between Muslims and other communities, most notably Hindus, not to mention, um, uh, uh, and also to mention Dalits, uh, who, uh, whose socioeconomic status is comparable or worse uh, than uh, that of Muslims. Um, there is a creamy layer of Muslims who have done well and whose class privileges offer them certain protections. But for the vast majority of Muslims, religion and social class are coterminous and their plight, uh, I fear, is actually uh, quite uh, dire, especially under the present government. Okay, thank you. So we, we have a series of, of questions that um, focus on various aspects of religion and intercommunal relations, mainly in India's domestic politics. Um, and time permitting, we will get to those. I do hope our, our audience won't mind, though, if I give a little bit of priority to a question that, that does address very specifically the kind of external dimensions of religion uh, in, in Indian politics. So this question comes from Amboki, um, and I'm really interested to hear your answer on, uh, to this question, Sumit, just because many of my colleagues who do research uh, in places like Southeast Asia, where of course you have Hindu minority communities, report in recent years that you have kind of RSS linked operatives showing up in places like Bali in, in, in Indonesia. So Amboki asks, how has Modi and his government propagated Hinduism and Hindu thinking abroad, especially where Indian communities coexist with other ethnic and religious communities? This is, again, a fascinating question amongst a whole range of others. Uh, um, uh, I mean, this is just a fascinating discussion. Modi has not made any explicit appeal, at least at a governmental level, um, the two uh, uh, Hindu communities, except he, he knows that a substantial portion of the diaspora is already well disposed towards him. And consequently, there has been significant outreach to the diaspora, including um, something that was started under the first BJP regime, coalition government, uh, called the Pravasi Hindu Devas. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, it's not Hindu. That's a Freudian slip on my part. I uh, put that in the, uh, the, the, the Pravasi Devas, uh, which essentially uh, 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 brings in, uh, Pravasi literally means a member of the diaspora, uh, that um, uh, it brings in people of the Indian diaspora who've been successful in countries across the world, literally, for a massive convocation in India, usually held in January or, or February, originally in New Delhi, subsequently in other cities, with considerable fanfare, with speeches, with seminars, with awards, um, uh, and um, 
not to be overly self-referential, but in the interests of full disclosure, um, I received uh, one of those awards under a Congress government um, uh, 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 because of my contributions such as they are to public affairs. Um, so the BJP has continued this, but the fascinating thing is it has chosen people who, uh, to honor in recent years who are much more sympathetic to their ideology. So there has been an outreach to the diaspora, but it has not had explicit religious overtones. I'm sure that surreptitiously the RSS is doing that work, but I haven't researched this and consequently my ability to speak to it with any authority is limited. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll move on now to a question from Sophie May Berman, who says, thank you for this insightful talk. Could you speak about this in the context of, and we had to get to it at some point, Kashmir and what she characterizes as India's state-sponsored terrorism as a mechanism of its secular assertions? Right. Um, I would actually, for all the sins of the Indian state, which I have written about ad nauseum in Kashmir, I would not, I would actually challenge the characterization of India's state-sponsored terrorism. Uh, that is a very loaded characterization, and I think it's frankly problematic. Have there been rampant human rights violations? Absolutely, yes. But name me one counterinsurgency operation in the history of counterinsurgency where states have not committed human rights violations. This is not in any way to sanitize the record of the Indian state. It's simply a tragic recognition that counterinsurgency operations are inherently violent and often harsh and even cruel. The Indian state is no exception. And I have written with considerable vigor and authority on this subject. Uh, so I am in not in any way trying to make this an anodyne uh, effort, but I would reject the characterization of state-sponsored terrorism. That said, on August 5th of last year, the Modi government crossed the Rubicon in Kashmir. And it did that by stripping Kashmir of its special status, which had been guaranteed in the Indian constitution since the 1950s. Now, Kashmir becomes like any other state in the Indian Union, and of course, it's also been broken up into constituent parts. Uh, from a strategic sense, if I were to be absolutely ruthless, I would say it makes eminent sense in that it significantly undercuts Pakistan's irredentist claim to Kashmir uh, because it says Pakistan has no legal locus standi. Kashmir is a, 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 like any other Indian state. And Pakistan, of course, has vigorously objected. The global community has shrugged its shoulders, largely because it doesn't want to touch this tar baby. Um, uh, that's one. And secondly, also, it's a recognition of India's global status. Pakistan is a marginal player. And who cares about marginal players in international politics? <laughs> it's, um, as the old Arab expression goes, you know, the dogs bark but the caravan passes. That's the kind of situation that Pakistan finds itself in. And in any case, Pakistan's moral claim to Kashmir was undermined in 1971, when religion alone could not form the basis of, uh, of uh, holding the state together. So what moral claim does Pakistan have on Kashmir? Uh, so given all that, while um, I have written critically of India's decision to abrogate Ka Kashmir's special status, it is tragically a fait accompli at this point. Okay, thank you, Sumit. So, so a, a number of the other questions deal with matters that I think you have, have touched on to varying degrees in answering some of the preceding questions. Um, and looking at our time, um, uh, I think this is, is going to have to be the last question though, and I'm circling back to Tarunjit, who's been a very 
consistent um, uh, contributor to, to the question list. Um, and I want to raise it just because it deals with one community that we haven't heard quite as much about in a presentation, which is the Sikhs. So with regard to Sikhs, um, Taranjit says, it seems to me that since the 1940s, India has empowered Sikhs Sort of, I guess, in, as a political community, it seems to have increasing disdain for the Sikh faith, especially when outside the domain of the Hindu faith. Um, your, your thoughts? Actually, um, I would argue that uh, in the 1980s, uh, Sikhs faced significant discrimination, largely because there was a religious insurgency uh, in a state uh, which is uh, almost just marginally uh, Sikh majority, Punjab. And um, because of that, and because of the Sikh uh, separatists, uh, some of whom had resorted to terror and were also being supported by Pakistan, there was a communal edge that had taken place. And ultimately, of course, tragically, this culminated in the uh, siege of the Golden Temple, which is the holiest shrine of Sikhism in 1984. Mrs. Gandhi sent in the army into the Golden Temple because a group of Sikh militants had seized the shrine and were using it as their lair to carry out terrorist activities throughout the Punjab and elsewhere. And ultimately, Mrs. Gandhi, unable to quell the insurgency, sent in Indian troops with a colossal loss of life and significant damage to religious artifacts, which alienated Sikhs and ultimately led to Ms. two of Mrs. Gandhi's bodyguards assassinating her, assassinating her the same year in October. Um, and then subsequent to that, there was, and I will use a loaded word, there was a pogrom in New Delhi against Sikhs, and about 2006 were massacred. And I call it a pogrom because the state was complicit in that police stood by and watched and did nothing to prevent innocent Sikhs from being massacred. This notion of collective punishment of a community does not behoove a democratic society. This was cruel, unjust, and ultimately a pogrom. We have to be absolutely blunt about this. Subsequent to that, um, there have been anodyne expressions of regret and uh, about the tragedy, but no real apology has been made by a Congress government to the Sikhs, um, and most Sikhs uh, grudgingly have moved on with their everyday lives, but that blot will forever remain in India's independent history that cannot be sort of swept under a rug. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Sumit. Um, uh, I, I'm afraid that we're at time. Um, uh, I have just thrown up in the chat room one last time um, the links that will allow you to download the policy brief that Sumit authored for us. Um, please be sure you do that. Um, there's also a link to the Geopolitics of Religious Soft Power Project. So if you'd like to sign up to be notified uh, about other events in the series and to receive information about publications that come out of the project, uh, you will be able to do that. Um, it, it just remains for me to thank Sumit for spending time with us this afternoon, for sharing his enormous insight, um, and for so deftly navigating a terrain um, that uh, is, is often so loaded, given the issues that, that we are discussing to, to, to together. So uh, thank you all very much for joining us. I'm sorry that we weren't able to get to all of the questions, but please let me assure you that we will be sharing the full transcript of the questions with Sumit afterwards. So he will at the very least be able to see the questions um, that, that, that you asked. Thank you very much for being with us this afternoon. Everyone take care, stay well, and we look forward to seeing you at a future Berkeley Center event. Bye-bye.